Hey everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes to me from D. Luisa, who asks, Steve, what the hell is up with adding kids in sequels? It happens in quite a lot of movies. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, The Phantom Menace, The Mummy Returns, Blues Brothers 2000, and the list goes on. Why, other than drawing in more money by targeting kids, do filmmakers think this is a good plot idea? These characters are often useless. The kid in the Blues Brothers sequel in particular is superfluous. His dialogue could have been altered and incorporated into John Goodman's character. Short Round could have been deleted entirely, or it would have been a good time to introduce Mac, the character from the Crystal Skull movie, another awful character that supposedly has a history with the main character that we're told about in a few lines of dialogue and we're supposed to care when he betrays the hero. The Mac character, though not a kid, was the same kind of throwaway character whose dialogue and purpose could have been incorporated into any of the other main characters. It's a shortcut. I think that's the long and short of it. It's, it's a narrative shortcut. When you introduce a child in uh, a movie where the protagonist is an adult character, you put that adult character into a guardian or parental role. Uh, it's, it's just a narrative shortcut. It's... It, it, it can work, but if, it, if you don't make it work, if you don't have a really good reason for doing it, then it feels cheap and shallow. I mean, it's, it's similar to why there are so many TV shows about cops and lawyers and doctors, because those are careers that lend themselves to story. It's easy to think of stories uh, about cops or lawyers or doctors because their jobs uh, have certain innate qualities that tend to put characters in situations where it's easy to come up with a story. And it's the same thing with parents or with, you know, mis mismatched partners. Maybe there's an adult who doesn't really get along with kids, and then you give him a kid, and oh, let's see what happens. It's, 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 it's just a shortcut. It's, it's a way for uh, a lazy writer to, <laughs> to get 120 pages of script without really having to put that much thought into it. Um, on, a, on a broader note, the whole idea of, uh, of adding characters, whether you're talking about a, a franchise or a series of films or a television series, I, I usually take the influx of new characters to be a sign of creative exhaustion on the part of the people producing the, the, the series or the, or the film, whatever it is. It's, it, again, sometimes it can work, sometimes it can be positive, but more often than not, it's a sign that uh, they're running on fumes. Uh, my wife and I just recently watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer all the way through on Netflix. And when you get to season seven of Buffy, all of a sudden there's like 20 new characters. All these uh, would-be slayers start coming into Buffy's house. And there's, you know, they all have names and they all have their little stories. And, and, and the more the season goes on, the more they get more and more prominent screen time. And the more they interact with Buffy, and it just feels like, shit, we have 22 more episodes to do. What the fuck are we going to do? Let's just throw some new shit in. You know, same thing happened to The Office, the, the American version of The Office. It just felt like they're just throwing new characters out. It's never a good sign. Dan Hellman. Hey, Steve. A friend and I have been having heated debates lately about the question, is the human condition getting better over time? And if so, in what ways is it getting better? The debate was sparked by Steven Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, a thought-provoking, though by no means unbiased, presentation of the history of violence down through the ages. I'm an historian in training, and my friend is a student of literature. I'm generally in support of Pinker's thesis that violence in modern societies is far less common than it has been in the past, while my friend is not convinced that this has in fact been the trend, nor that if it were the trend, it would necessarily imply that the human condition has in any sense gotten better. My friend notes, for example, that the comfortable lifestyle enjoyed by many Westerners today may have only been attainable at the expense of worse living conditions in certain non-Western societies. I can't shake the feeling that part of my friend's skepticism regarding Pinker's thesis stems from his training in 20th century literary theory, which was so informed by postmodernist reactions to Enlightenment ideas about objective moral progress and social Darwinism, 
From your previous videos, I gather that you too are trained in 20th century literature and literary theory. I would love to hear some of your thoughts on this, on this issue. Are you skeptical as well, or are you comfortable asserting that progress has in some sense been made over the last several thousand years? If you do believe in progress, how would you respond to skeptics like my friend, or to certain voices from the neo-Marxist camp who would say that in talking about progress as a real thing, one is doing nothing more than flirting with such old-fashioned concepts as ethnocentrism and moral absolutism? Moral absolutism. I see what you did there. Very sneaky. Um, and it worked, because you, your question made it into the video. Uh, you know, of, between you and your friend, um, I think I would say that your field of study is probably a lot more relevant to the question than his. And I, I say this, as you mentioned, as someone who was an English major in college. I don't know if I'd really go so far as to call myself you know, <laughs> trained in 20th century literary theory. I have an English degree, uh, if that counts. But um, I think that his skepticism about both the concept of progress and the actual trend of real progress, I think that's healthy. I think it's a good thing. I don't think we should get too comfortable with the idea of life is so much better now than it used to be that we become complacent and, and, and our, our drive to improve things begins to, to fade away. But I, I think I'm with you I'm, I, and, and with Pinker here. I, I, I do think that, that on the whole, things are probably a lot better today than they were a hundred years ago. Uh, a lot of that has to do with scientific progress, with advances in agriculture, with advances in uh, advances in medicine. Uh, so, I, and a, but a lot of it also depends on how you define progress, on how you define quality of life. I'm sure you could come up with a definition of those terms that would indicate that things are not that much better, or perhaps not better at all today than they were at some time in the past. But you could also make the opposite argument, depending on how you choose to look at the issue. I tend to look at it a little more uh, optimistically as, as you do and say that on the whole it seems like things are generally getting better. But I, I caution everyone who, who agrees with me on that and who feels that way to not lose sight of the work that remains to be done, both here in my country, the United States, in the West in general, and in the rest of the world. Uh, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, uh, where there's still dire poverty in many places. Uh, there are still great improvements that need to be made, uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that, and we should continue to pursue those goals. But, yeah, I agree with you. Overall, it seems to me like things in general uh, are better now than they were. Cyril B. Hey, Steve, what do you think about the studies that have suggested that when someone loses their faith, they tend to adopt a new set of irrational beliefs, not necessarily tied to atheism at all, but perhaps getting into conspiracy theories or belief in Bigfoot or whatever. I've tried to think of some belief I might hold now that I didn't before becoming an atheist, but then I realized I'd probably be the last person to recognize it as a silly irrational belief. Do you think you've adopted a new one? Good question, and uh, Kiovar also asked a question about a similar subject, about uh, people adopting irrational beliefs in the absence of, of traditional religions. Um, well, I don't think I've adopted any new irrational beliefs since I started identifying as an atheist, but as you say, I mean, I might be the worst person to judge that. I, you know, I might have a belief that I don't consider to be irrational that, upon further reflection, might turn out to be irrational. So I don't, I, I, right now, I don't think so, but who knows. Uh, as far as people adopting irrational beliefs after they emerge from, from religion, that's why I think it's important when atheists oppose religion and when we, we criticize religion that, that in addition to criticizing the particular claims or the particular traditions of a religion, that we also... Uh, take time to oppose the, the type of thinking that underlies religion, the type of thinking that allows people to accept claims from religion. Because it's the same type of thinking that allows people to accept conspiracy theories, that allows people to accept pseudoscience. Uh, a person who believes that Bigfoot is a real creature probably 
uses some very similar thought processes to reach that conclusion as a religious apologist would to justify belief in a particular religious tradition. So it's not just religion that's the problem. It's the thought processes that, that allow for religion, and those need to be uh, illuminated and opposed and debunked, refuted, etc. as well. Jason Brunet, Steve, I'd like to hear your thoughts on Walk the Line. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I've probably got it memorized, but I get the impression that a lot of folks thought it was stupid. I want to hear what you think is great or not so great about it. Jason mentioned this to me on Facebook, too, and said that uh, he, he thought he was like the only person who liked Walk the Line. And I, I like Walk the Line, too. I don't think I like it as much as you do, <laughs> Jason, but uh, I do think it's a good movie. I see why other people don't like it. I've, I read the negative reviews of it that were published when it first opened, and I, I get what they're saying. I mean, the, the weakness of Walk the Line is that ultimately it is just a biopic. There's nothing really artistically outstanding about it. It doesn't feel like a, like a movie that had to be made. I don't really think it's like a towering work of cinema. It's a pretty much, you know, by the numbers biopic of a famous person. What redeems it to me is Joaquin Phoenix. I think Joaquin Phoenix's performance as Johnny Cash in that film is uh, incendiary. I mean, he's just brilliant in that performance and the fact that he not only acts but also sings all of his songs just makes it even more impressive I mean he's just so damn good in that movie and he's good enough I think to mostly elevate it above uh, the mundanity of the rest of it the mediocrity of the rest of it um, it's competently made it's not like a bad movie it's it's very it's very well made it's uh, workmanlike you might say uh, but what really like raises it up is Joaquin Phoenix and how fucking amazing he is as Johnny Cash. And the fact that he gives a performance, he's not trying to do an impersonation. I mean, with the voice, he's obviously changing his voice a little from his normal speaking voice to kind of get in the ballpark of Johnny Cash, but he's not trying to sound exactly like him. When he sings, he doesn't sound exactly like Johnny Cash. You can tell that's not Cash singing, but he still does a good job. He basically does really nice cover versions of classic Johnny Cash songs on the Walk the Line soundtrack, and I just think the whole thing is great. Uh, it's so it's it's a one man show, but it's a hell of a show. And the the material surrounding the uh, the Folsom concert is just excellent. I almost wish they had made the entire movie just about Johnny Cash at Folsom Prison. Just that whole concert, make a fictional film, a dramatic film about Johnny Cash playing a playing a concert at Folsom Prison, and have the exact same cast and the exact same director but just limit the scope of the movie to that. That would have been amazing. Uh, but that's not what they did. And instead we get Walk the Line, which is uh, a, a decent biopic elevated far above the material by an amazing central performance. Sepia Siren, question. I need to write a TV show Bible. Been researching and having a hard time finding a consistent format. Do you know anything about it? Like... What should I include? How many pages? How much info and material? I could put CGI images of characters and character descriptions, but just afraid I'm going to leave something out. If you had to write a TV show Bible, how would you write it? Also, is there a way to create an electronic internet Bible, or should it be hard copy or both? The TV show Bible would be for a 30-minute program. I've never had to write a Bible for a TV show, so I can't really advise you from experience. And for those of you who might not know, uh, the Bible for a TV series is basically uh, a reference document that the creators of the show put together so that the writers of the show will know uh, what the established status quo of the show is. So that when, you, it, when you're writing your script for an episode of MacGyver, let's just say, to just pull a series out of my ass... Uh, you'll be able to fit your script into the established limits of that show and your story will fit that series and the tone and the personality and what have you of that series. So it's basically a reference document for the show for the writers to use. Um, as far as I know, there isn't a consistent standardized format for show Bibles. I think it just depends on the show, on, on the, the desires and the needs of the producers. Um, my 
my advice to you, and you say you've researched it, so I don't know if you've been to this website or not, but there's a website I found uh, when I was looking around trying to find something that might be helpful for you. Uh, I'll put the, the address on the screen here. And it's uh, sites.google.com slash site slash TV writing slash Bibles. And there's a whole slew of examples of uh, TV series Bibles on there from uh, half-hour programs, hour programs, comedies, dramas. There's just a lot of examples that if you haven't seen it, I may, maybe you've already looked at this, uh, but if you haven't, I would recommend looking at that and just reading a few examples and maybe look for a show that is kind of sort of in the format or similar to the tone of the show that, that you're working on uh, and see if that helps. Because, I mean, I know as, as a screenwriter, uh, the I learned more, all due respect to my screenwriting teacher who was amazing and to whom I owe so much, but I learned more about screenwriting from reading screenplays, from reading examples of other people who knew how to do it. Uh, than I ever did in any class. And if you want, if you've never written a show Bible before, that would be my recommendation to you: is find examples of show Bibles, see how other people do it, and then you can decide what you need to do and how you want to do it. Travis Yost, hey Steve, I just finished the Nye Ham debate. I loved that Bill Nye continually explained his position with great enthusiasm, while Ham seemed to be sort of just reciting the same tired, boring, profoundly short-sighted scripture. It's easy to be dumbfounded by his ignorance, but when I think about it, people like Ken Ham can be described by one word, dangerous. Your thoughts? P.S. Sorry I sort of rambled. Don't worry about rambling because the bit you just heard me read was like the fourth take of me trying to read your question. So I have no idea why it took that many times. It's not because you rambled. It's because I have marbles in my mouth or something for some reason today. Uh, I think ham and creationists in general who are able to uh, put even a, a, a slightly credible face on that sort of thing are dangerous. I, I think one of the most powerful messages that Nye kept coming back to in that debate was uh, how how dangerous, to use that word, it is for our future if we are, if, if we get into the habit of graduating science students who don't understand science. Uh, I thought Bill Nye did an incredible job in that debate. I was very pleased by how it went. I thought he came across very informed and, and, and genial. He was Bill Nye the science guy. You know, I think he was he was exactly what he needed to be. He, he went on that stage and he was Bill Nye the science guy. And uh, he was firm and he was he confronted Ham about a lot of the false things he said, but he was very friendly and very likable when he did it. I thought it was a great performance. Um, and one of the things that Ham kept demonstrating over and over and over again is that he doesn't know what science is. He claims he does. He says what he does is science, but he doesn't. He he demonstrates that he doesn't understand it. He he admits, and it's to his credit that he admits this up front, that his beliefs are he, begin with the Bible. And as soon as you say that, you're not doing science. You're starting with a conclusion that the Bible is true, and then you're you're building everything else from that base. That is not science. Even if you use scientific method-like procedures to conduct experiments and make observations and reach conclusions, if you're starting from this base that you refuse to move from no matter what, that the Bible is the Word of God and, and the way you have interpreted it is the one and only correct interpretation and is the absolute ultimate truth, you're not doing science. That is not scientific. That is, in fact, unscientific. So that's one. And then he had this bullshit distinction that he kept ret returning to again and again that Nye called him on a couple of times. This distinction between uh, observational science and historical science. As if they're two completely different things. As though when you study the past and when you study the present or when you study some phenomenon in, in a, a laboratory, as if you're using different scientific methods to do it. It's a complete horseshit distinction. It's imaginary. Ken Ham just completely made it up. And he's lucky that his God doesn't actually exist. Because if he did exist, you know, when I was a kid, uh, people would say, like, if you said or did something wrong, if you told a lie or something, that you better, uh, you better watch your ass because 
people who told lies were liable to get struck by lightning. And I know If it isn't time for the lightning round, may God strike me dead right now. The lightning round. Rapid fire questions. Glib and adequate answers. Dangerously talented, your good news videos are normally much shorter than your five stupid things videos. Is this a critique on the current state of the world? No, it's, if anything, it's a critique on how hard it is to find genuinely good news uh, in, in the media on the internet. It's much harder, it's much easier to find the shitty news than it is to find the real, actual good news. Um, it might also be a critique on what a lazy fuck I am. Finite Atticus. Hey, Steve. Everyone in the northern states has noticed the phenomena of exhaling into the cold outdoors and seeing their breath. However, I've never seen a fart do the same thing. I even had a friend on a camping trip fart bare-assed into the cold winter night with no mist whatsoever, even though there is a fair amount of moisture in a fart. Have you ever seen fart mist? Do you think it exists? You know what? Show me the evidence. I don't believe shit until I see the evidence. You want me to believe that fart mist is a thing? Show me the fart mist. I've been on camping trips like that. Matt Lesnar, Steve, do you doubt your atheism like I do? And how often? I don't think I seriously doubt it that often. I think there's room for doubt. I, I look at it that way. I think if there were ever evidence that disproved my atheism, I would accept it. I'm not 100% certain. But I don't, I, mean, I don't really have moments uh, where I think like, oh shit, maybe there is a God. That doesn't really, I don't, that doesn't really happen with me. Um, I'm, I'm, my provisional conclusion, it's, it's provisional, but it's, it's pretty well settled in my mind. You, I need to see new evidence in order to revise it. Uh, Jacob Duchesne, if Superman has enough strength that he can turn Zod's head far enough, fast enough to break his neck, doesn't it stand to reason he could have just turned Zod's head back away from the family of people and held it there until they could run away? Yes, and congratulations, Jacob. You just put more thought into the climax of that film than the people who made it. Dr. Themo, when you see somebody on Facebook or Twitter post an opinion that you find repugnant, how do you know if it's worth putting your two cents in about why they're wrong, and how do you frame that discussion in a way that's non-adversarial, yet also productive? Well, it, it first depends on whether or not I feel like I have anything interesting to say. I mean, if someone posts something repugnant on Facebook and it's something that I've talked about like a million times before and I don't feel like I can say anything new or interesting, then I usually just ignore it. And as, I mean, as for how do I phrase it non-adversarially, let also productive, um, you can be adversarial, you just don't have to be combative or, or treat the other person like an enemy. I, focus on the content of what they're saying, not on them as, as a person. You know, say like, you know, that's kind of a stupid thing to say. And then explain why you think it's a stupid thing to say. Don't just say, hey, you're a fucking idiot. Dave Nathan 2002. Quick one, Steve. What's your favorite guilty pleasure movie, book, album? Oh, a movie. It could be a million different things. Uh, I love Roadhouse. Roadhouse is a great guilty pleasure movie. And pretty much anything with Patrick Swayze is a great guilty pleasure movie. Book, right, actually, right now I'm reading a comic book. It's, uh, uh it came out a couple years ago. It's Batman Odyssey by Neil Adams. He did the story and the art, and it is fucking bonkers. It is so, like, epically bad. It's so, I'm, I'm definitely going to do a review video about it. I, I think I'm probably going to do like a Google Hangout video about it too, where I, where a, a, you know people can come on and we'll just have like a roundtable discussion about how fucking nuts that book is. Uh, it's whew, damn, Batman Odyssey. And album, I don't know. It's probably something Michael Jackson. I mean, I, I love Michael Jackson, but it's so like shallow and silly. You know, it's definitely Michael Jackson music is like a guilty pleasure for me. Uh, Jarb2104, hey Steve, why does the lightning round say glib and adequate answers? Most, if not all of them, seem adequate and not glib. Maybe I am missing the sarcasm? No, you're, you're just missing the point. This is all just smoke and mirrors. This is just a distraction to deflect you from the fact that you just spent half an hour watching a video of me just sitting here talking to a camera about nothing. It's all just distraction. 
Vero25, you always end your five stupid things video with the hardest part is only picking five, but is that always true? Not once you've had to make an effort to find those five stupid things, no exceptions? Oh no, there are definitely exceptions. There are times when it's hard to write those videos. And when, uh, when I say the hardest part is only picking five, I, that's not really true. So I mean, I'm a liar is basically what you forced me to say. So I hope you're happy. Michaela Carter, silly question. Do you think having sex with the Hulk would kill me? Yes, for God's sake, do not have sex with the Hulk. That goes for everybody. Women, men, everybody watching this video, for Christ's sake, please, please, do not have sex with the Hulk. I know it sounds like a good idea at the time. Do not do it, because you will die. He won't mean it. I mean, he, he, he doesn't mean any harm, but he, he will fucking kill you. Don't do it. I hope I've gotten through to you. Well, that's it for the questions. I'm going to get out of here in a second. But before I do, I want to give a shout out. I want to give the shout out this week to the Skeptic Fence Show. I've given shout outs before to Joe on some of his other channels, Live Life 8072. And I want to focus this one on the Skeptic Fence Show because I took part in the, uh, the pre and post show discussion that uh, the Skeptic Fence Show gang hosted during the uh, the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate, we did a pre-show before the debate. Then uh, we streamed the debate on Live Life 8072's Vaughn Live channel. Then we had a great post-show discussion afterwards. It was so much fun. Uh, the guys involved in that show, uh, Live Life 8072, Negation of P, Cocktopus Prime, uh, Matthew Steele. I had such a great time hanging out with those guys. We had a really great, uh, an intelligent yet really fun discussion. Um, and they have a big show coming up soon. I think this weekend they, uh, there's uh, an episode of the Skeptic Fence Show uh, with David Silverman. And I'm looking forward to watching that. That should be a fun show. And they, they've had Lawrence Krauss on before. It's just a really cool, interesting show uh, where you can see they've been getting some really decent guests lately. And you can see like these people that you probably would know, like Krauss, like David Silverman, and see them in a, maybe a slightly different context, a little more loose, fun, informal atmosphere uh, than you maybe have seen them in before. And it's just, it's, it's worth a look. It may not be everybody's cup of tea, but uh, I always have a good time when I, do sing, when I do things with those guys, and I think it's worth a look. So if you haven't watched The Skeptic Fence Show, check it out. Well, that is it for this week. I'm going to be back next week to do this all over again, provided, of course, that you guys ask me some questions, because for me to do this, you have to ask. So leave a comment on this video asking me anything about anything anything you want to hear me express an opinion about any question you have for me no subject is too serious no subject is too silly ask me anything and i will answer as many of them as i possibly can in the next video so until then you guys take care have a good week and i'll see you